Mark. I spelled it all this morning about Tennessee winning yesterday. I'm going to be quiet tonight. <laughs> they didn't do too good today, did they? So uh, Auburn folks, uh, you all can be happy tonight. <laughs> I'm excited about being here. Aren't you glad that our, our joy is not dependent on a ball game, though? Amen? Our joy is dependent on Jesus. And I'm excited about being here tonight. I'm sort of like the older couple was. They'd been married forever and ever. Amen. And they were sitting out under the big oak tree one night in the swing. And the wife looked over to her husband and said, 50 years ago, we sat in this same swing. And 50 years ago, we sat under this same oak tree. And 50 years ago, we sat under this same moon and stars. And 50 years ago, you whispered sweet nothings in my ear. And 50 years ago, you nibbled on my ear. About that time, the older gentleman stood up and started walking back to the house. And his wife said, uh, where are you going? He said, I'm going to go get my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> well, he got excited. I hope you're excited. Uh, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles down tonight and open them to three different passages of Scripture, and they tie together around one word that you're going to find in each one of these passages. Look, first of all, in Romans chapter 4, verse 20 and verse 21. Romans chapter 4, verse 20 and verse 21. Now, if you've got your place there, say amen. amen. He that is Abraham. Stagger not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded. Now, underline there in your Bible that word fully. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform or to complete. And then look back to Luke chapter 16, verse 30 and verse 31. Here the rich man is down in hell, and he's crying out from hell. And the Bible says, and he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. Though underline there in your Bible that word neither. Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And then look back over to Acts chapter 26 and verse 28. Paul has preached the gospel to King Agrippa. And Agrippa is responding back now to Paul in verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me. Underline there in your Bible that word almost. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I'm preaching tonight on the subject persuaded. Fully, never, almost. Let's pray together. Father, I do pray now that you not only would bless and anoint the reading of your word, but also that you might bless and anoint the preaching of your word. Lord, we're completely dependent upon you moving in this place tonight. All is vain unless the power of the Holy One comes down. So God, unless you show up here tonight, all is in vain. I pray for those that would be here tonight who've never been saved. I pray they'd come to Christ and trust him tonight and be born again into your family. When the invitation's extended in a few moments, may people respond to this altar in obedience to your call. Shut out every voice that would seek our attention. May we only have ears to hear what the Spirit of God has to say. May your perfect will be accomplished. May the name of Jesus be honored. In his name I pray. And again, all God's people say, amen. Proverbs 27, verse 1 says, Boast not thyself tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. These are days of uncertainty. The old timers here tonight will have to admit that we've never seen a time like we're living in now. Now I know that we've said that through the years but how true that is. And anyone here tonight over 40 years of age will have to admit 
that we never seen days, a time, like we're now living. The Bible says there, Boast not thyself tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Been about a little over five years ago now. I had that truth hit me like never before. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. My normal schedule is like this week. Normally I leave on Saturday to either drive or to fly where I'm going to go preach revival. Normally I preach Sunday morning through Wednesday night. That's pretty well typical. And then on Thursday I either fly or drive back home. This week I'll be flying back very, very early. Uh, in fact, I think I'll have to get about 3 o'clock in the morning to get back, to catch the plane that morning. But that day I had uh, got back home about lunchtime, and my wife met me in the kitchen. And she said, I have a little numbness here in my cheek. And I have a little numbness here in the ends of my finger. And she'd been a nurse. She'd already figured out what she thought was wrong with her. She thought that, said she thought perhaps she had Bell palsy or Maybe she'd had a mini stroke or something. She said, I've got a doctor's appointment this afternoon. And so she went to the doctor that afternoon, and they ran a, 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 a CAT scan. And the doctor said, I really believe we need to do an MRI in the morning. So she went back Friday morning. They did an MRI. Came back that afternoon, about 2 or 3 o'clock that afternoon. The doctor's office called and said, you need to get back real quick. Now, whenever the doctor calls and says, you need to get back real quick, you know that's not good news. And so when she got back that afternoon, the doctor said, you have a tumor here in the front side of your brain about the size of a golf ball. And said, we've already got you set up to meet with a neurosurgeon here in Jackson, where we live in Jackson, Tennessee, uh, next week. And she said, no. I said, I really don't want to go to a neurosurgeon here if it's something like that. I said, I'd rather go to MD Anderson out in Texas. And he said, well, you'll never be able to get an appointment there. She said, well, I'm going to try. And so on Monday morning, she called M.D. Anderson, told him what was taking place, called back on Tuesday morning and said, when's my appointment? And they said, well, this coming Friday at 8 o'clock. I was in revival that week in a church there in West Tennessee, so I was driving back and forth. So on Wednesday night when the service was over, we started driving toward Texas, drove all the way through on Thursday. On Friday morning, we met with the uh, neurosurgeon there. They'd already sent him the test. It had been run in Jackson. And when we met with him, he said, you have glioblastoma, stage four. That's brain cancer. And said that we've already got you set up for surgery next Thursday at 8 o'clock in the morning. We had not planned to stay there, but we stayed on through the weekend. They began to run tests and make preparation for the surgery Monday through Wednesday the next week. On Thursday, they performed the surgery. It was over 12 hours long. And when everything was over, uh, the doctor came out and said the surgery went good. We got over 98% of the, uh, the tumor. And we stayed there for another couple of weeks as she recuperated, came back home. And a month later, she started in her chemo and radiation treatments in Memphis uh, under the watch care of MD Anderson. That went on for six weeks. When the treatments was over at the end of the six weeks, the following day when the treatment was over, her colon perforated as a result of the steroids that she was taking to keep the swelling down from the radiation. I called the ambulance to come to our house. She bought them out twice on the way to the hospital that evening. They performed emergency surgery all night long. And for the next uh, six weeks, she was in ICU unit, most of the time was on a ventilator, and at the end of the six weeks, she was, went out of the room. But from the time, to make a long story short, from the time that she went in with the perforated colon, for the next seven months, she never came back home. And at the end of the seven months, she passed away. That day when I walked in that kitchen, and she said, I have a little numbness here in the ends of my finger, and I have a little numbness here in my cheek. My life completely changed. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Now, if we don't know what one day will bring forth, how do we know what's out there in the future? If you don't know what one day will bring forth, how do you know what's out there in the future? Let me go a little further with that. 
Not only are these uncertain times personally, but also these are uncertain times for our nation. Our nation's in a mess. And what's taking place in our nation now may well determine whether we're going to survive as a nation. Brother Greg, I was reading some time back where one of the big prophetic writers was writing that God does not care anything about America. And he was making that statement because he said that there's no mention of America in the Bible in prophetic ways. Now, I don't know about all of that, but I do know this much. God loves souls. God loves sinners. God will save anyone who would trust Christ. God will bless any nation that will bless Israel. God will bless any nation that will send missionaries around the world. And I believe that God wants to send revival to America. But also these are uncertain times economically. I mean, uh, one day the economy will be up. The next day it seems like it's down. One day you'll have some money in your pocket, and the next day they'll be empty. One day you'll be driving down the road, and you'll see the gas prices begin to come down where you think they ought to be. And the next day they shot back up. Some Arab somewhere blew his nose. <laughs> These are also uncertain times for the family. The very definition of marriage is being redefined by some. The USA Presbyterian Church, also the First Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina, and the First Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, two years ago said that they are now recognizing same-sex marriage. You don't find that in the Word of God. Now, while I'm in the neighborhood, and while I'm driving down the street, let me go on and say this. Marriage is between a man and a woman. I don't care what Obama used to say. I don't care what Clinton said. I don't care what Trump says. I don't care what Supreme Court says. I don't care what Congress says. Two men living together, two women living together is a sin and abomination against holy God. Now, if you don't like that, build a bridge and get over it. <laughs> but not only are these uncertain times personally, not only is the future uncertain for our nation, for our economy, and for the family. These are uncertain times. But there's some things that we can know that we know that we know. We can know that God's real. We can know that we're saved. We can know that when we die, we're going to go to heaven. I want us to look at that little word, persuade. It literally means to be thoroughly convinced, absolutely assured, to be won over with a powerful message. Aren't you glad that when you were a lost sinner, when you were half a heartbeat from hell, that you heard a man of God stand up with the word of God, and the Spirit of God made that real to your heart, and you believed, you trusted, you were persuaded, you were thoroughly convinced, and God saved your soul. Amen? Now I want us to look at that word persuade around these three things. Fully, never, almost. Number one, fully. If you look back there again in Romans chapter 4, Paul goes back thousands of years to Abraham. Abraham, who was 100 years old, his wife, who was 90 years old. Now, I don't want to discourage anybody. But if you're 100 and your wife's 90, that's a pretty good indication you ain't going to have no more babies over at your house. I mean, again, if something like that had happened around my house, I mean, it would have been Elizabeth. This really is the big one. <laughs> but God told Abraham, you're going to have a son. No one believed God other than Abraham. And the Bible says there in verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform or to complete. Paul said that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God. <clears throat> Abraham, who was fully persuaded that God was going to keep his promise concerning that earthly Isaac, then how much more 
Should we believe God concerning that heavenly Isaac, the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, if Abraham could believe God without a gospel preacher, how much more should we believe God today? Now, apparently, this word persuade got to bubbling up in the mind, in the heart of Paul. And Paul picks up again with that word over in 2 Timothy 1.12, where he said there, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded, there it is, that he is able also to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. I love that word, know, for I know. In the Bible, the word know is used in two basic ways. First of all, there's a knowledge that we gain by experience. And then secondly, there's a knowledge that we gain because we know God. Now, there's some things I know by experience. I know that fire burns. I know that snakes are dangerous. I hate snakes. I don't care what kind of snakes they are. I hate snakes. I don't big snake, little snake. Green snakes, black snakes, spotted snakes. I hate snakes. I don't care whether it be a live snake or dead snake. I hate snakes. Now, if you like snakes, okay. I hate snakes. I made that statement sometime back and after the service. There was a, a lady who came up to me and said, uh, let me show a picture of my pet snake. <laughs> and so she gave me a picture. And on that picture, she had a great big snake wrapped around her neck. And I looked at her and I said, that's stupid. <laughs> now, I know you're not to call somebody stupid, but that's stupid. I, I hate snakes. Snakes are dangerous. Bee stings hurt. I mean, we know that most men don't know much about women. I mean, there's just some things we know by experience. And then also there's a knowledge that we gain because we know God. When God saved you, he imparted in you a certain knowledge, a certain assurance. Now, I don't know I'm saved by experience, although when God saved me, I did experience God. But I know I'm saved because I know God. This is a knowledge that the world does not know anything about. You say, well, does this make us better than the world? Not necessarily so, but I sure am glad in a world of uncertainty I know God, for I know whom. <clears throat> Salvation is not in church membership. It's not in water baptism. It's not in the Lord's Supper. It's not in religious activity. Salvation is not in a plan, but a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. For I know whom I have believed. <clears throat> Sometime back, I had a person, Brother Greg, came up to me and said, you're preaching an easy believism. I said, say what? They said, well, you're, you're preaching an easy believism. I said, you stand up there and you say, if a person will come to Christ, if a person will trust Christ, if a person will believe in Christ, that God will save them. I said, I'm glad you were listening because I preach that because that's what the Bible preaches. The Bible says in Acts 16, 30 and 31, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thine house. John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Romans 10, 9 through 11, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For of the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and when the mouth confession is made into salvation. For the scripture said, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Listen, you can know that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. There's that word. That word persuaded, there's a picture of driving a, a nail through the wall and attaching on the other side. You couldn't talk Paul out of his salvation. You couldn't convince Paul to follow after another gospel or another Christ. He said, I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. You say, preacher, aren't you afraid that some false teacher may come along and lead you astray? Now look up here. 
when God saved me as a 13-year-old boy at the Blue Springs Baptist Church in Rutledge, Tennessee, on a Friday morning in a vacation Bible school, when God saved me that morning, he put the Holy Ghost in me. And ever since that morning, whenever I hear a false teacher or a false prophet, there's something that raises up inside of me that says, liar, liar, liar. Now, I've got, a, I've got a secret ministry that a lot of people don't know I've got. Now, my two preacher boys say, Daddy, you're kooky for doing this. Well, I'm just going to be kooky. I'm just going to keep doing it. I have an elevator ministry. Whenever I get on an elevator, I just start preaching. I've got them. They can't get away. There they are. <clears throat> When my wife and I were out in Houston, there at MD Anderson, <clears throat> you know, uh, the hospital goes up 20-something stories, a huge, huge building. And so uh, we got a little elevator there one day, and it's a big elevator. I mean, big, huge elevator. And so uh, people just kept coming on and coming on, coming on, coming on, coming on, coming on. And finally the door shut. Big congregation. I had them. <laughs> and so I was standing in the back of the elevator, and I just started preaching. I said, sure, it's good to be saved. Good to know Jesus. I said, I'm a winner. I can't lose. This elevator goes up, I go up. This elevator goes down, I still go up. I can't lose. It's great to be saved. And there's this little wiry looking guy standing over here in the corner. He had on a pair of uh, shorts and little wiry legs. I don't know why wiry leg guys wear shorts like that, but little wiry leg type guy. And he was over there in the corner. And he looked back at me and he said, Well, I believe I'll come back like a robin. I believe I'll come back like a bluebird. And I looked back at him and I said, You probably will. <laughs> you say, I just don't believe a person can know that they know that they know that they know that they're saved. Well, you don't believe the Bible. This Bible does not preach or teach a think so, hope so, reckon so salvation. This Bible preaches a no so, life changing, heaven going salvation. You can lay your head on the pillow at night and say, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Are you saved? Do you know that you're saved? Are you fully persuaded that you're saved? If I were here tonight and I did not know that I know that I know I've saved, there'd be no way I'd walk out those doors until it was settled. Number one, fully. Number two, never. Look back over there again in Luke chapter 16. Beginning there in verse 27. Listen to what the rich man said. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Here that rich man was, he said, raise someone up from the dead, have them go to my five lost brothers, testify to them so they won't follow me in this place of torment. Look up here. When a person is saved, they want everybody else to be saved. When a person dies and goes to hell, they don't want anybody else to go to hell with them after they get there. He said, raise someone up from the dead. Have them go to my false five lost brothers. Testify to them so they won't come to this place of torment. In essence, God says, that's impossible. If they will not believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. You know what that means? <clears throat> that means if you won't get saved tonight by the clear, simple preaching I'm doing right now from this book, you wouldn't get saved if God were to perform a miracle. I mean, if you wouldn't get saved by the clear preaching I'm doing right now in this book, God 
You wouldn't get saved if God were to write your name in the sky. You say, preacher, are you saying there's some people who would never be saved? Yes, there's some people who would never be saved. Not because they could not be saved, but they refuse to be saved. I preach the gospel. I preach that Christ died on that cross. I preach they place it into that grave. I preach that three days later he came out of that grave and he's alive. I preach that God loves you. I preach that God wants you to spend eternity with him in heaven. I preach if you repent of your sin and trust Jesus, that God will save you. I preach the gospel. And the Spirit of God takes that and makes it real to your heart, convinces you that you need to be saved. The choice is now yours. Every man, woman, boy, or girl that's in this building that's saved, no one forced you to be saved. You had to make that choice yourself. If I were here tonight and I sense in any way right now that I wasn't saved, if I sense in any way that the Spirit of God was calling me to be saved, I wouldn't wait for the invitation to be extended. I'd run to this altar now. I'd fall on my face now. I'd cry out now, Dear God, in the name of Jesus, I repent of my sin. Jesus, come in my heart and save my soul. Number one, fully. Number two, never. Number three, almost. Look back again over in Acts 26. Paul has preached the gospel to Agrippa. And in verse 26, Paul said, For the king knoweth of these things, but through whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian. Wouldn't you love to have been there that day? Brother Greg, wouldn't you love to have been there and heard been just a fly on the wall and heard Paul preach that day? Paul was a powerful preacher. Paul was a powerful persuader because he'd been persuaded himself. Time out. Time out. There ain't nothing like hearing a man preach about being saved who saved himself. There ain't nothing like hearing a man preach about the blood of Jesus who's had his own sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. Now, I know when I preach, I stomp, I shout, I stutter, I even spit. But I want you to know, I believe every word of it. I know what it is to be saved. I know what it is to be born again. I know what it is to know in my heart that when I die, I'm going to be with God in heaven. Listen, it's real to this old boy tonight. Paul preached the gospel to Agrippa. And you can almost see Agrippa as his hands begin to tremble and his heart begins to melt and his chin begins to quiver and he reaches out his hand to take Paul by the hand and then he jerks it back. And he begins to think, if I become a Christian, I'm going to lose my position politically. And he looks back to Paul. In essence, he says, Paul, you know, you're pretty good at what you do. And almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Let me give you three results very quickly of being almost persuaded. Number one. To be almost persuaded is to be lost altogether. Some of you, one day you're going to stand before God. You're going to say, Lord, I joined the church. That's almost, but not enough. Lord, I got baptized. That's almost, but not enough. Lord, I tried to treat people right. That's almost, but not enough. To be almost persuaded is to be lost altogether. Secondly, to be almost persuaded hinders other people. I mean, what would have happened if Agrippa were to be saved? Could it have been that Felix would have been saved, Festus would have been saved, Bernice would have been saved? Could it have been that the whole nation would have been moved toward Christ? Mama, what about that little girl 
that's following your footsteps. That little girl that loves mama. She thinks mama is the greatest thing in the world. Where are you leading her? Daddy, what about that little boy that's following daddy's footsteps? He wants to be like daddy when he grows up. Where are you taking him? But then the most tragic thing is this. Agrippa died and went to hell himself. I don't read any place in the Bible where Agrippa ever got saved. Do you? I don't read any place where Agrippa ever called on the Lord and trusted Jesus to save him. And you know the most tragic thing is this. God loved Agrippa just like he loved Paul. Jesus died for Agrippa just like he died for Paul. God gave Agrippa the same opportunities that he gave Paul. And he's given to you right now. But Agrippa died. And he went to hell. I shared with you this morning that the one preacher that has had the greatest impact upon my life and my family's life was Dr. J. Harold Smith. And I shared with you, I was with him a lot and heard him tell many, many stories out of his ministry. Another story that he told about preaching revival in Greenville, South Carolina in a tent crusade years ago. And he said one night when he was preaching there in that tent, there were four teenagers on the back row, two boys and two girls, and they mimicked him. They mocked him and ridiculed him throughout the whole sermon. Now, if you've ever saw uh, J. Harold Smith preach, I am mild compared to him. I mean, he was animated. Any of you all ever, any of you ever see J. Harold Smith preach or hear him? You, you know what I'm talking about. Very animated. I mean, he'd wave his arms, and he'd wave his arms. They'd wave their arms back to him. He'd kick his leg, and when he'd kick his leg, they'd kick their legs up like that. And he had an uncanny laugh. When he would preach, he would, ha, ha, as he would preach. And they'd even mimic him and mock him as he would preach. And when he got to the invitation, he said that he pleaded with them to be serious and listen, but they just continually ridiculed him and mocked him. And when the service was over, he and the pastor were standing at the back of the tent. People were walking out, and he was greeting them. And when one of these teenage boys walked by him, he reached out and got his hand and held on to it like that. And he looked at him and said, Young man, you didn't mock me tonight. You mock God. But God loves you. Jesus died for you. And God wants to save you. And he said, that young man pulled his hand back. And he looked at him and he said, old man, I don't have time for you. Me and my buddy are going to take these two girls out of here. We're going to drink beer with them. We're going to have sex with them. Old man, we don't have time for you. And he said, they walked on out, got in their car, drove away. He said about uh, 20 minutes later, an ambulance came by the tent with a siren on. And then the police came by with a siren on. And they looked over the pastor and said, Preacher, uh, let's go see what's happened. They got in the car, drove down the road a little over a mile, and there's a curve in the road. And in that curve, they saw where a car had run off, run into a big tree, and exploded and was on fire. And in that car was those four teenage kids. Now go back in your mind with me. Go back with me 20 minutes later. Go back with me a mile earlier. <clears throat> what if those four teenagers, instead of walking out that way, had come down to an old-fashioned altar and got on their knees and cried out to God for salvation? Instead of being in hell, they'd have been in heaven. You see, that's just how close salvation is. I mean, you can step out in this aisle tonight and you can either choose to go away from Christ or you can choose to come to Christ. And I'm going to plead with you, don't go away from Christ. Come to Christ. There's some of you, you're fully persuaded. You know that you know that you know that you're saved. Amen? 
I mean, you can go back to a time and a place where you know God saved your soul. And then the others of you, you'll never be saved. Not because you could not be saved, but because you refuse to be saved. And then there are others of you, you're seriously considering being saved right now. You know you're lost. You know you need Christ. And you're seriously considering coming to Christ tonight. And I want to plead with you. Don't go away from Christ. Come to Christ. The day is going to come when some of you will hear this preacher preach for the last time. you hear Brother Mark lead the music for the last time. You'll go through an invitation for the last time. You'll walk by that last pew for the last time. You'll walk across the parking lot for the last time. You'll get in your car and drive away for the last time. I'm going to plead to you tonight. Don't go away from Christ. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. He'll save you. He'll save you. He'll save you. I'm going to ask you if you will to bow your heads. Close your eyes. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. <clears throat> and I want to ask you the same question I asked you this morning. How many of you can say, I know that I know if I were to die this very moment, I'd be with God in heaven? No question about it. I know that I'm saved. There's been a time, there's been a place in my life where I repented of my sins and I trusted Jesus to save me. And I know if I were to die this very moment, I'd be with God in heaven. I'm going to ask you, as I ask you this morning, if you know that, just lift your hand up again as a testimony. Now, don't lift it if you don't know for sure. Don't lift it unless you know for sure. Okay, thank you. God bless you. The Bible says if we believe on him, we'll not be ashamed. Now, there's some of you tonight that did not lift up your hand. Some of you lifted up your hand, but you say, Preacher, I really don't know for sure. And I'm going to ask you tonight, if you don't know for certain, if you died, you'd be with God in heaven. I'm going to ask you, as I ask you this morning, let me lead you in a prayer right where you're sitting right now. Make this your prayer, where you ask God, forgive you of your sin, and ask Jesus, come to your heart to save you. Just saying the words won't save you. You must mean it from your heart. Will you do it right now as a youngster? Teenager, adult, church member. Let me lead you in that prayer right now. Pray with me right where you're at. In the balcony, here on the floor, whoever you are, get it settled right now. Pray with me. Dear God, I know you love me. I know Jesus died for me on the cross. I know he came out of that grave and he's alive. But God, I've sinned against you and I'm lost. And I cannot save myself. God, forgive me of all my sin. Jesus, come in my heart right now and save my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I'm going to live for you the rest of my life. Now, I'm going to ask every one of you that asked Jesus to save you the best you knew how just then. I'm going to ask you, if you will, just look up here at me. Just open your eyes. Look up here at me. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if you ask Jesus to save you just then, the best you knew how. Just look up here at me. Just for a moment. You look up here at me. Sweetheart, did you pray that prayer? Did you pray that prayer? Okay. Okay. Anyone over here? Anyone in the balcony? Did you pray that prayer? Anyone? Now here's the invitation. If you're here tonight and you trusted Christ, you ask him to save you. We're going to stand. We're going to begin to sing. Pastor's going to be standing here at the front. I'm going to encourage you. You come and take him by the hand and say, Brother Greg, tonight I trusted Christ. He's going to pray with you, share some things that's going to help you. Or you may be here and you say, I just don't know for certain. Listen, don't leave here tonight with any doubt. The Bible says these things are written in you that believe on the name of the, believe on the, name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. God wants you to have the assurance. Don't leave here tonight with any doubt. Get it settled. Or you may be here tonight and God stirred in your heart as a Christian. There's some things you need to get right with God about. Listen, this altar is going to be open for you to come. You make your way here. Will you do it? Now, if you're here tonight and you don't know Christ, get it settled. You be the first one to step out. Let's stand. 
Let's begin to sing. Pastor's going to be here at the front.